Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Lassen, the Managing Director of the Center for Community Change, and I am so pleased to welcome all of you, including those of you who are sitting over on this side, who I can mostly see, uh, to uh, this important discussion today, a uh, discussion of poverty and housing policy uh, in recognition of housing now's 25th anniversary. Uh, and um, I just want to say that the Center for Community Change, uh, I and my colleagues who are here, are uh, really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, it is uh, such an important conversation to be having um, at this moment, uh, as we are eight days uh, away from the midterm elections. And uh, I very much look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists, but first, um, before we get into the panel itself, I want to introduce and thank Jerry Jones, Executive Director of the National Coalition for the Homeless, um, for the important work that his organization is doing. I know that the board was meeting here um, over the weekend, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, really uh, wrestling with a set of complex uh, issues that we're going to be hearing more about today. I'm going to bring Jerry up to make a special introduction of a special guest. So, Jerry, over to you. Thank you, Mary. I, I should point out that I'm a, a proud uh, former staff member of the Center for Community Change and we're very grateful uh, for CCC to host this event. Um, I am uh, I'm very honored to introduce uh, Donna Brazell, who was my first big political boss in terms of my, my uh, early career, the person who taught me more, I think, than uh, anyone else in terms of uh, organizing and activism. I had really two amazing mentors uh, when I was uh, first working on uh, poor people's issues, housing issues in the 1980s. One was a, an amazing individual by the name of Mitch Snyder, who uh, worked on homelessness uh, and hunger issues in the 1980s, and uh, I worked and lived with Mitch uh, for two years at the Second and Deep Shelter, uh, just four, three or four blocks from the U.S. Capitol, and had the honor of being with him on his last fast, uh, getting arrested with him, traveling. Um, he loaned me, essentially, as a member of CCD to work uh, with Donna Brazil on the March on Washington in 1989. It took about a year organize that march. Um, and one of the ways that I was the Southern Field Coordinator was my role. Um, so I spent uh, about two weeks in a car with Mitch. We met up with Michael Stoops, who's in the room at some point. Michael was uh, helping organize that march. Um, and, and literally hundreds of grassroots organizers, activists on this issue along the way. And then I, I worked for Donna to make sure all those folks would have to get the buses together and come to D.C. in October. So it's a great honor. I, I know that everyone in this room is familiar with Donna's work. Uh, she is not only one of the most thoughtful and uh, impactful commentators on national politics, uh, she is the former uh, manager of the war campaign. She's done uh, more, I think, in this election, which is a key election, uh, where so much is at stake. To get the word out, she's coming in from uh, several days on the road, uh, mobilizing, doing GOTV, and so uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to Don Rizzo. Maybe going back home to Louisiana, or seeing about going home to law school. 
Um, I had so many things that I wanted to do with my life. I was uh, 28 years old. Yeah, I know this is what 54 looks like. So uh, <laughs> I turned 29 that year. And um, I was eager to continue my activism and, of course, my organizing. But Mitch uh, said to me, he said, I have a, a unique project that I would like your help with. Now, back in those days, as many of you know, when you finish your campaign season, the first thing you want to do is rest your weary soul, and then the second thing you want to do is go out and get a real job. Um, but when Mitch Snyder called me, I'll never forget it, as long as I live, I lost my mother just a few weeks prior to his call, and um, I said to Mitch that I was grieving. I was grieving my mother's death, and that I didn't know what I was going to do, and he told me about this project. And I said, give me a night to think it over. Because I knew Mitch, he was, he was tireless, he was passionate, he was so committed. He was a moral voice, he was a champion for the poor and the downtrodden. Mitch didn't care about color, you know, didn't care about the color of your skin, didn't care about your religion, your ethnic background, your sexual orientation. Mitch cared about the hungry, the homeless. He was such an incredible human being. So the next day I called him and I said, Mitch, you know what? My family was homeless back in 1983. We lost our property. That's an old story about what happens to southern black folks, poor folks, who lose their land and all of a sudden it's put up for sale and you don't even know about it. And I said, you know what, I've got to do this. And I've got to do this because it's the right thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an incredible moment in our history. We were able to galvanize people from all parts of this country. They came together with a single focus to put a national spotlight on the lack of affordable housing and the growing need in our country to deal with poverty and homelessness in our country, including homeless veterans. We had, I don't know, Jerry, but we had to raise money, I mean, just from all sources. Nothing came easy for us. But Mitch and so many, many others lended their hands, they loaned us money. Somehow or we made it, we got buses here. And I'll never forget that day when we brought tens of thousands of people up to Capitol Hill to lobby, to lobby for their own rights, lobby for decent, affordable housing and an end to homelessness in this country. This is not just a celebration. This is a moment for us to renew our commitment. I made it back from Louisiana. I spent the last couple of days in Georgia and Florida and my beloved home state of Louisiana. I'm off tomorrow to California. I don't know I'm hit Milwaukee, hit Columbus, come back home, get another change of clothing, teach my class, and then I'm I'm going to round up my, my weekend in the Northeast and call 2014 over. But let me tell you what's never going to be over. And that is our continued fight to end homelessness in this country. The housing crisis does not get as much attention in this country as the financial crisis did. We bailed out Wall Street, but we forgot about people on Main Street and people who are suffering and people who are homeless. We have more politicians mocking the poor than willing to give the poor a helping hand. More politicians willing to demonize people simply because they work two to three jobs and they need a living wage, not just a minimum wage. More and more Americans unable to afford to live close to home because housing prices is just off the charts. When I came here back in 1981 as a young college student just graduating from LSU, I had $5,000 worth of debt, student loan debt. I was able to find an apartment for under $300 because we had Dave Clark and John Wilson, two big giants who fought for rent control, who fought for low-income housing here in the District of Columbia. This is a fight that we all must now continue to believe in, to continue to struggle for. And although I'm not back on the, as they say, the battlefield, more or less I'm on cable television, which is another kind of battlefield. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't grown tired. I haven't grown weary. I'm going to continue to fight. I'm going to continue to raise these issues. I'm going to continue to tweet about it, put it on Facebook. But we need to demand on our next anniversary that we get answers from our political leaders. The one thing I have talked to President Obama about, and let me just tell you, I give him a good grades on a lot of issues. The one thing that I told him over and over again, again, I said, Mr. President, your grade on housing is not that good. You need to do a better job. 
And he knows he needs to do a better job. And I know with our voices, with our strong support, we will continue to put a lot of focus and emphasis on ending homelessness, ending poverty in this country, which is I've seen 14 million children living under poverty. There's so much more that we can do. But I just wanted to come today and say that I'm with you. I'm speaking up. I'm going to continue to march on. I'm going to remember what we did 25 years ago. And if you need me to organize again, well, you know, Jerry knows how to reach me. <laughs> God knows, Jerry. I said, Jerry, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'll be back in Washington. But I told him if I made it home, I would be here. And I just wanted to tell all of you I'm here because you are still doing the Lord's work. And I know if Mitch Snyder was here, he would also, with his green jacket, his jeans, his black turtleneck, Mitch would demand that we march on the White House and march on the Capitol. But I know Mitch would also tell us, don't forget to vote. It's a crucial election. So God bless you. Do not grow weary in doing, in, in doing good. For in due season, it's a life to say, we'll reap that harvest. And thank you. God bless you.
multiple buses of people uh, up for the housing now march. Um, and, uh, and, um, and two of them were uh, community volunteers for our agency, the agency was the David Lennon. And they were both from very prominent uh, Richmond families. Uh, they were not married to each other. Um, and at the Housing Now March, they fell in love. And it created a huge scandal in Richmond that they were now uh, a couple, but they are still married today and uh, have a long-standing relationship. So, so it was a bit of a romance that got created uh, at that event. Anyway, it was a great event. It was a huge uh, crowd, and there was a strong sense of possibility uh, that, that uh, came from that. And as we know, um, not long after that, the um, uh, National Affordable Housing Act of 1990 was passed that created the home program, uh, designated um, the requirement for the CHAS, if you want to get rid of monkey, and uh, that led to the requirements for, uh, for local planning. So, um, so it had a, a, an important effect. But here we are 25 years later, we still have um, homelessness in the United States and our shortage of affordable housing for the lowest income people remains um, uh, worse than it was in those days and with no uh, sign of abating um, anytime soon. Um, and that's a, on one hand, that's a discouraging uh, statistic and a discouraging experience on the other hand. Um, it requires that you get up every morning and put one foot in front of the other and keep working at it because um, there is, uh, there are solutions, we have solutions, we know what to do. What we have to do is organize enough to be able to convince the powers that be that, that this is what they should do, including the president. It would be really good if the president um, uh, picked up our message. Um, uh, let me just say a quick thing about um, the intersection of, of housing and poverty. Um, I come from uh, the world of social work and community-based organizing, community-based service delivery. I came to housing um, by understanding that without housing, uh, the good, solid, affordable, decent housing, all of the work that we did to help people on many other fronts was uh, not going not to be successful. It was not, gonna, it was not um, going to, we weren't going to be able to achieve what we wanted to achieve um, if people didn't have a good place to go home to at the end of the day, that they could afford it, that was stable, and that they could raise their children. And, um, there was a really important study that was done in Boston by some social workers, uh, social work faculty, um, who looked at the, um, the records of a large number of uh, families who had been cases at uh, uh, nonprofit um, family practice uh, kinds of places, clinics, social work clinics, um, to look at what were the factors that contributed to social work effectiveness for what they called um, very hard to reach families. And there were families with lots of problems, lots of Lots of issues. And so they did this, you know, really fancy regression analysis. They threw all these factors into it. And at the end of the day, the thing that impeded the ability of the social worker and the clients to work together for success, the single most important factor was their lack of affordable, decent homes. It had nothing to do with the skills of the social worker, it had nothing to do with all of the other problems that the folks brought to the table including uh, very serious poverty. The single largest factor was the lack of housing. And so, um, so it became clear to me that housing was where I needed to go. And then I got to Washington and I go and I start working on housing and it's like, you have to hang out with bankers. <laughs> and you have to talk about housing finance. And you have to talk about, um, you know, you have to deal with a lot of landlords. And, and uh, people who, uh, for whom housing is a business, housing is an industry, um, it's not a human intervention. Um, and that's a very different world to operate in. And I think part of the reason that we have such a hard time making the translation from understanding the, the, how serious uh, an impact on 
uh, families are that, that we don't have decent housing is that so much of the housing debate is governed um, by and led by people in the world of commerce and see housing as a commodity as opposed to a social group. Um, so it's a very uh, difficult world to, to straddle and to try to uh, bring this message um, uh, into that. I think at the National Income Housing Coalition, we have worked very hard to uh, try to be that voice in both sectors, uh, both in the housing sector about how essential how we have to work on housing for the lowest income people. And with me, we're not always popular. And I know that we can be this kind of garden party when you go to some of these meetings and say, wait a minute, how deeply targeted is this program? Well, how much of this is going to go to really poor people? Don't tell me it's affordable. You know, that's a very global term, but how much of it's really going to go to poor people? And then you've got other sectors where you've got people working on human needs, and housing isn't necessarily on their radar. And so, um, so it's a it's a world that we have to figure out how to bring together uh, more closely. Um, I am just really delighted to be here today um, with my friend Jerry Jones. I just uh, did cartwheels when I heard that Jerry was going to work uh, for my friends at the National Coalition for the Homeless, and um, I expect. Uh, Great, thanks, Thanks. So I, I am here to give a more personal perspective um, on homelessness as I am formerly homeless. And so 25 years ago, uh, I was not at the march. Um, <laughs> I was too young. I was. I actually was in New Jersey, and I was dealing with being homeless and hungry. Um, so I just wanted to give more of a perspective of, you know, we're talking about advocates, um, but I'm a self advocate, and I think that's a part that's also critical because we always want to fight for other people without understanding the real struggle. Um, and so I was homeless as a kid. So if we can imagine um, having to do well, how are you productive? I mean, we all travel. And if you don't get a good night's rest, are you productive that next day? Meetings or at school, how are you productive if you don't get a good night's rest? Or if you don't know where you're going to rest? Um, that's something that I dealt with, my family has dealt with. Um, you know, most of my young life. And so I was able to um, work through that and work myself out of poverty that I was born into and obtain, you know, an advanced degree. And so that's great and that's amazing. But I also had to deal with homelessness again a couple of years ago because I started a program, a small nonprofit program. We all know about the budget and the funding, you know, that nasty F word. And, uh, <laughs> and I struggled with the, small nonprofit and um, essentially lost everything again in 2011. And it's a tough, um, tough, tough place to be after working myself out of um, poverty. And being now, you know, two years removed from being in the shelter, I still see women that were in the shelter that are working and they cannot afford housing. So they're working every day and they're either going back to the shelter in the evenings or they are going to a transitional facility or I know one girl with her young baby is going to a hotel. And that's unfortunate for myself. I am working, I am underemployed. My housing is connected to my employment. If I were not to work there, I would not be able to afford to live in Montgomery County, Maryland. If my home was not connected to my job, I could not afford to live in Montgomery County, Maryland, as it stands right now in a decent house, housing for myself. And so I, I just really want to put a face, and I know sometimes my face doesn't necessarily reflect um, the masses of, of some of the homeless people, but there are a lot of middle class people that have lost their homes and are homeless due to you know, the economic recession. So that's how it affected me. And so I just, you know, I, I want for us to always understand what it feels like.
to be on this side. And so I'm fighting on this side. And you guys are fighting on the other side, and it's not us against them. However, um, I just really want you to understand what it feels like to lose and then still have to get up and be productive. Housing is very, very critically important. How do you move forward? How do you, I always say, how do you train? How do you train? And not literally train, but how do you, I would not have been able to be successful if I would not have found a way to dream. And for me, I always say, and it's an aside, but reading for me provided that opportunity to dream because what I was faced with in my life was poor and dank and darkness all around me. And reading provided an outlet for me to see that I could do anything. Lots of people, children, aren't able to dream because they are afraid to even close their eyes because of, this, because of what they're facing. So let's just think about that as well. So why is that? Uh, 
Um, and I think that's part of what we need to say back to the people who say that nothing works. You know, the fact is that given what I'm about to say, which you all know anyway, uh, we've done incredibly well. Uh, to end up at the end of the 20th century with 11.3% poverty, uh, rather than, and that's almost the lowest that had ever been, 11.1 in 1973. Uh, in light of what's happened, that's phenomenal. Uh, now, it's way worse now, which is a combination of sliding in public policy and, of course, the effects of the recession, because it was 31 million when Clinton left office and 45 million now. But just tick off very quickly. Uh, I can do, believe me, I can do many hours on the subject, and you, you'd be out of here. Uh, I would love to still talk about you'd be out of here. Uh, number one, we've become a low wage nation. Well, I have to tell you that. Uh, that's the heart of it. Uh, whether it's a question of people who uh, have jobs that are homeless, uh, all the way through, whether it's it's uh, uh, single moms who are out there uh, with the possibility of uh, only finding one job for their household because there's only one bread, possible breadwinner uh, in the household, and uh, ending up with uh, women who have children. Um, being the, in demographic terms, the, the, the most low income, uh, the greatest um, percentage in poverty, uh, well over 40%, bigger than uh, African American, Latino, Native American, as serious uh, as those are. We didn't foresee these things happening. We didn't foresee the, the change in, in our labor market, the globalization, uh, the technology, uh, the, uh, what's happened to unions. Uh, and so, uh, and we're not facing up to it as a country. Uh, we just, there's a, raising the minimum wage is vital. We're making some inroads finally about that now. That's great. What we need to do to tackle being a low wage uh, nation is so that you have 106 million people uh, who have incomes below twice the poverty line. A third of the people in this country are, are really uh, basically near poverty. Uh, if not in poverty. And then the, the changes in family structure, also not foreseen. The changes in public education uh, over the course of the de decades, exactly when we began to need to, for everybody to get through high school and even get post-secondary education in order to qualify for the jobs of the 21st century. The mass incarceration uh, that, uh, if you look back to Looking at this forward from 1968, uh, when we had made those gains, uh, I didn't say to you that the specifics of what we did in the 1960s was to cut poverty in half. It was, it was 22% in 1959, it went down to the 11% that I mentioned in uh, 1973. Uh, African American poverty went down from 55% in 1959 to 31% in 1973. These great gains made us quite optimistic uh, in 1968 uh, with all of the tragedy that there was of losing Robert Kennedy, losing Dr. King, um, Edgar, uh, Malcolm, and others. Uh, so every one of these things that I'm talking about is something that came on to us uh, uh, when we did not foresee it. Low wage uh, moms in that terrible labor market, education mass, incarceration, changes in immigration that, of course, are very much uh, part of the work of CC and many of you uh, in this room. Uh, the fact that we, we uh, made uh, not really enough progress, not even progress, on concentrate, concentrated poverty, inner city, rural, Appalachia, as well as uh, uh, inner city. Uh, and then, of course, uh, deep poverty, where we have, by uh, the census, 20 million people. Uh, with incomes below uh, half the poverty line, below 9,500, as you know. Uh, and uh, that's doubled since the mid-70s. The percent uh, has, has doubled. And of course, that's largely due without going into, because here I can really go off, uh, what, what they did to cash assistance uh, for moms and, and children uh, in our country. And, and that's, that's the fundamental cause of it's women and children. Again, that's the fundamental cause of uh, where we are in terms of extreme poverty uh, in the country. Six million people whose only income is from food stamps. It's astonishing. Um, 
continuing. Again, we thought we would have made more progress on aspects of race. We've made huge progress in many ways. But uh, when you have race and poverty combined, uh, that's just a combustible uh, compound. Uh, and, and of course, uh, similarly for women, uh, women generally have done pretty well. Low-income women, more so. Um, and finally, the equality that we all know that we have, uh, and that we've begun to tackle in some of our politics, but sort of lost our way in the last couple of years. Uh, what got started by Occupy kind of hasn't been picked up. So um, I hope I've been concise enough. Uh, I really have to say, and I'm sure we all feel this way, we, we fear for the future of our country with, with the amount of the power uh, of the wealthy uh, and the corporate interests in our country. And um, I say particularly with Donna here, but Donna, I say it wherever I go, we need a different politics. We absolutely, we want to make progress on all of these things, that we can do our work on the issues, but at the bottom, we will not make the kind of progress that we want to make. We don't have a fundamental change in, in politics uh, of the country that we live. Thank you um, to all three of the terrific panelists that came before me. Uh, I want to say uh, that since the Center for Community Change was founded in 1968, that one through line to our work has been that low-income people themselves, particularly in communities of color, need to make the changes uh, that improve the communities and the public policies where they live. And that conviction that uh, people who are personally uh, affected by economic and social injustice are best equipped to know what change is needed and how to get there has to be central uh, to our work moving forward. You've already heard a little bit about the fact that since the Housing Down March 25 years ago, there's actually been a significant backwards movement on affordable housing uh, with an unbelievable backing off of federal investment in affordable housing uh, since that time. Uh, and we've seen um, some change uh, that TJ mentioned in terms of who you know, is among the homeless, with an increasing number um, of women uh, and children now counted among the growing number of people without a home. In the last 30 years, the Housing Trust Fund Project uh, here at CCC has been a bright spot in terms of what's possible uh, in terms of affordable housing work at the state and local level. Uh, and during this time, we've helped create over 700 local housing trust funds to develop dedicated funding streams for affordable housing across the country. And I think there are a couple of lessons out of that that I just want to share very briefly um, before we open things up. Um, one is that it is possible, um, particularly in local communities, to bring together uh, people uh, who are themselves homeless, who are advocates, together with um, public health, education, um, government officials, and developers. And we've seen that happen in uh, a number of places across the country. And running local campaigns where Putting a face on uh, what homelessness is all about has really helped to develop some capacity for long-term fights. So a couple of examples. Um, in Bellingham, Washington, in 2012, there was a ballot measure that generated $20 million to address homelessness and housing needs of very low-income families. In Lexington, uh, Kentucky, there was recently a housing trust fund passed with a strong coalition of faith community organizing groups, public health and educators, and public utilities. And these kinds of broad alliances with low-income people themselves and homeless people themselves at the center can be replicated in other places. That involves cultivating and developing the capacity of local leaders and making sure that from the start their involvement is central. I want to close by saying just a little bit about 
um, a big, bold initiative that the Center for Community Change has embarked on. We're in the early stages of a 10-year campaign to take on poverty in this country. And at the core of this economic justice campaign is the engagement of the 106 million people that we've heard about who are living at 200% or less than the federal poverty level. And I would say in places like Washington, D.C., where the cost of living is so high, that that means that those are the very people that TJ was talking about who are um, getting bounced out of housing. Today, the economy in our country is off balance. Wages, as Peter said, have remained stagnant, while the cost of housing and other basic needs continue to rise. The wealthiest are the ones who are benefiting, while more and more people struggle to earn enough to provide for our families. So that's the long-term vision um, that we need to tackle. Um, and we believe that it is possible to create a society in which everyone has enough to thrive. This will only take place within the context of a powerful national movement for economic justice that brings people together who are working on housing, who are working on jobs, who are working on food issues, kind of across the board. Um, and it must be led by those people who are directly affected. And there are three things that we believe are important in this. One is increasing the scale and intensity of collective action, things like the Housing Now March, uh, by low-income people. Um, and we want to think that that means engaging lots of new people who are not now part of organizations to become involved in organizing and voting and in online action. It means making poverty reduction a broadly held political goal. And we want to see a vibrant public debate about these issues in the run-up to the 2016 elections. And we invite all of you here today to work with us on that. And finally, it means enacting large-scale public policy change and changes in the private sector that have a concrete and measurable impact on lifting individuals and families out of poverty. Breakthroughs like the $15 an hour minimum wage victory in Seattle are an example of what that could look like. So we are focusing on jobs, um, on improving the quality of jobs in low wage um, industries, and removing barriers to employment for people who are formerly incarcerated, and creating new opportunities for jobs that are accessible to people who've been shut out of the economy. And this movement that all of you are involved in for affordable housing is key for going to make a real dent. So with that, let me stop and um, turn things back over to Jerry, who's going to moderate the Q&A. Thank you.
people who work with the owners um, to do with property management or with residents to kind of get more involved politically um, and to also become aware of their rights as uh, low income residents and affordable housing. Can I just tell Can I ask where you're located? Edgewood Terrace. Yeah. Edgewood Terrace. Yeah. Edgewood Terrace. Edgewood Terrace. Edgewood Terrace. Edgewood Terrace. So when you're, let me just be clear, you work for a Community-based nonprofit that is redeveloping the property, and in that process, your people who live there now are going to be displaced, and you're told to figure out what to do with them. That's your job. There's so many. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's just be clear that everybody understands that in the name of affordable housing <laughs> and the affordable housing world, uh, poor people often lose their homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, the, that's part of the, the serious dilemma that we have, is that the, the, there's a perception that, pe that affordable housing developers are doing the right thing. Um, but in fact, unless it is focused on preserving the homes of the people who live there, there's something missing a lot. So, um, uh, so our perspective is that you don't ever go into new development without a 100% plan for preserving the homes of the people who live there. And, and, that, and that that has to be, first of all, the policy of your organization. So I'll go speak to you people. Um, policy of your organization. But it also means that it has to be the policy of your local government that's putting money into these projects to say, we're not giving you funding unless you have a plan, an anti-displacement plan, because all the new housing in the world is lovely, but if the people who lived there before are now homeless, you have not succeeded. Um, and uh, so that's where organizers come in. That's where people who go and make sure that the people who are living there know what is coming and what they need to do to prevent uh, the loss of their homes. They need to understand their rights. They need to understand their um, options. They need to demand to have a voice at the table uh, in any kind of redevelopment. Um, they need to be... Um, the, there's there are sister ways of understanding the potential for redevelopment to come in um, and uh, being alert to that. Um, but that's a lot for us to expect low income people to do who are on a day to day basis, you know, just trying to get by and get to work and take care of their kids and do all the things that, that they need to do. Um, but it starts with how, it starts with the basic premise of what the organization is doing. Great question, great response. Yes. Um, yeah, hi. Um, this is for the whole panel, but I'd just be curious. Uh, if you Tell us who you are, sir. Sorry, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, I'm Bob Francis, uh, currently at Johns Hopkins University, studying poverty. Um, so, what policy recommendations might you offer? This is sort of software. I, I know what Sheila might say, but. Um, if you had a magic wand tomorrow or in the near future uh, to make a policy change in housing, what could help ameliorate this problem we're talking about homelessness and lack of affordable housing for the next year? Do I get to answer first for the people who might not want my answer? <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. It, solving the housing problems is very poor. It's really easy. All we have to do is make very small changes to the mortgage interest deduction so that the mortgage interest and we don't uh, so the federal government is not subsidizing high end high income expensive housing at a very high rate that it's currently doing under our tax policy you make modest changes to the mortgage interest deduction uh, you can um, do two things one is that you can help subsidize homeownership for low and moderate income people to the tax code, which we don't do now. And two, you can raise enough revenue to solve the housing problems of poor people in the United States. And here's the, here's the important piece about that. It doesn't cost any more money. 
it, we would not have to, the federal government would not have to spend more money than it does now. It just has to spend its money smarter, um, more efficiently, and um, more progressively. Can I just say there's also uh, the uh, it's also uh, you're number one on the list. Uh, you gotta know, have it be that people aren't poor. And that's true. And that's a list of things. Uh, if you're working, it's, it's a uh, list of things. Some of which are the employer's obligation, uh, generally speaking, mandated by law. And and some of it is working work supports of a variety of kind that. Uh, that are intrinsically important, but also are income equivalents. Uh, a income equivalent, working worker support, child care, yeah. housing vouchers, uh, help with house care, uh, with health care, uh, help with going to college. Yeah, thanks for simple care. But anyway, it, it goes on. We have, we have to uh, deal with the resource side of the people who are going to live in that housing, etc. I mean, that's just the... I, I want to just... Sorry, Karen. Um, I, don't, I completely agree with what um, Sheila and Peter had to say. I also want to say that I think, you know, alongside of this, there has to be organizing. Um, and it's not just a policy solution. Uh, it's about people who are you know, in an ongoing way, organized to protect uh, what goes on in their communities and to keep them uh, safe and affordable, um, to increase civic engagement, because the kinds of things we've been talking about um, are not going to be won without a fight, and there will be pressure along the way to take them, take them back um, once we get there. I think we have time for probably just one more question. Brian, uh, my community organizer in Cleveland, uh, and I just I started volunteering 20 years ago. I've been around for housing now, but certainly housing now was inspirational. In you know thousands of people got together, stood up, and said we really we want to make this a priority in the United States. But I was just wondering if you have any inspirational thoughts now, because in my 20 years I've seen that things have gotten really bad where we now accept a, a group of people are going to be homeless for long periods of time and stay on the street. When I started, families were a priority and churches and mayors would run around with their hair on fire when, when a mom a child came in and, um, who was homeless. And now we just seem to accept that as part of the day-to-day -day operations of every city in America, that we don't, no one has their hair on fire anymore. Google housing. 10 years and hopefully it's it's, uh, it's fundamentally about what's happened to our, <clears throat> our economy. And so that produces, uh, whether it's, you want to take it sort of indirect and direct, it produces a whole lot of people who uh, have these lousy jobs, uh, can't make ends meet, etc and get really, really angry. And they don't have anything left in them. Uh, you know, maybe you could make a, tell them or make it a religious point that they need to care about everybody. It's just human nature to worry about the next penny and the next nickel right now. And so there's huge, as you know, I mean, huge anger in our politics. Um, we're not going to get there until we can convince the country that there needs to be, if I can make a small joke, a business model for, uh, for all of us, uh, which is about enough income that is mainly from work. And that in turn means a different public policy that in addition to seeing that work, the existing work produces a living wage and, and a safety net for those who don't have work. But also uh, the investments, uh, Paul Krugman had a, a column, I think it was this morning, about infrastructure, if I remember my newspaper correctly. Uh, we need to take that idea and say it isn't just about infrastructure, it's about uh, publicly financed jobs. They don't have to be working for a government. In a system of childcare for our country, 
uh, in uh, a, a system of building houses, housing for our country. Uh, there are so many needs that we have, and you have to pay for it. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's uh, a sell to get the country to buy it. But uh, the jobs, in the way it looks for the 21st century, are not going to be generated in enough numbers if we don't have a larger public investment in work. I'm, uh, I want to give a response as well. Um, and then I want to bring up our, our closing speaker. Um, so one of the differences, I think, in uh, the effectiveness of the anti-poverty sector compared to other social movements that have been many things lately, I think about the immigrant rights movement, I think about the LGBT movement, is that they are organizing on a scale and with a level of seriousness that we have not had um, in a number of years. And so when we were organizing housing now, I remember uh, I heard Mitch's stump speech at every stop along at least the southern group, and he would quote Frederick Douglass, who made the point that power never concedes anything without a demand. It never has, and it never will. And what we've got is what we will have until we start organizing to demand more. So I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, to bring up John Barbinski, the president of the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, to say some closing remarks. John. So I just want to thank you all for being here for this important conversation. I want to thank the panelists, Peter and uh, the others, in terms of uh, of sharing their perspectives on on this important issue. Just a co couple of thoughts. You know, um, Sheila says that housing is an industry. You know, dealing with homelessness has become an industry as well. And, and I'm not pleased to be one of the leaders of that industry. I think we need to work ourselves out of business and it needs to continue to be our, our focus. Um, you know, one of the homeless policies now that's being driven by HUD is that is making prioritization about who gets limited access to shelter and to housing. And we're being asked to make a choice to say that veterans should get housing before a pregnant mother or a baby or a mother with a two a uh, day old baby, and yet those choices are happening time after time in our community, and it's not right, uh, and we can't be silent to that. Um, I, I saw that, you know, and Don was here, you know, I think what we need is an inspirational leader like Mitch. I, I was fortunate to spend a week on the streets of D.C. with Mitch uh, when we were uh, advocating for the McKinney Act, uh, and I was able to bring two buses from Denver for the Housing Now March, and we've been too silent for too long in terms of remobilizing uh, people around the uh, But I read that there's $5 billion that will be spent on the election, mostly on negative campaigns, people trying to tie uh, congressmen to Obama, and folks trying to tie congressmen to government shutdowns. And if we could only take one-tenth of a percent of that amount, uh, five million dollars, and invest it in doing another housing now in March, uh, and mobilizing communities at the grassroots level, people experiencing homelessness, and their advocates in the, in the community who are working with them. That's the only way that we're going to change the debate in our country uh, to, to bring the truth to power and to make that work. So I, I invite you to help us build a movement uh, that, that ties these issues together, housing and homelessness, income inequality, uh, living wage, uh, and let's do that uh, in our communities back home, and let's make sure that people here in Washington hear that mes message time after time. So again, thank you for being with us. I hope we, to work with you uh, as we try to mobilize the communities toward these ends, and thanks again for our speaker.